you want to know what I think was the biggest bit of irony behind Kiyakia's production? It suffered from a severe case of too many chefs in the kitchen, or in this case, too many writers in the staff room. Now granted, some of them were longtime reliable guys like Jin Tanaka, Mutsumi Ito, and Junko Komura, but then you get a handful of no-name amateurs writing one or two episodes each, or guys like Kazuhiko Irukai, who in spite of never writing for Prey Gear, wrote a sizable chunk of episodes. You can thank him for giving us this thing. And as is so often the case when everyone throws their stuff into the pot, we ended up with a very subpar final product. Yet, as is also so often the case, the cream managed to rise to the top. Fumi Tsuboda wrote arguably some of the best episodes of Kira Kira. Yukari's debut episode, Julio's debut, the Yukari vs. Julio episode, the Princess Yukari episode. Yeah, she really liked to write for Yukari, for whatever reason, and tweet about it a lot. Oh, and also, she plays Fate Grand Order and managed to pull both Anastasia and Atlanta Alter in one role. No, I'm not jealous. No, sorry, Bob. No. But, yeah, she's very talented and even wrote Dream Stars. To me, she has a very clear vision of what Precure should be all about and isn't afraid to push the envelope a little bit. Such dedication earned her a well-deserved head writing position for the preceding season. And thankfully, Toy seems to have learned their lesson. As of the time of writing this script, Hagato's writing staff is still relatively small and most of the episodes are being handled by Tsuboda. In the end, both Hagato and this manga are proof positive that it's all about quality over quantity. With that said, let's take a look at the product of mostly just two people with the second volume of Kia Kia Precure all aboard. Actually, since this was written by twins, does that technically count as one person? Kidding, kidding. The sixth chapter opens with the girls working at a zoo. Eh, it's just not the same without Totsuki. But yeah, this is meant to be a sort of cross-promotional deal with the Kiapati staff working as zookeepers for the day. Though Ichika wasn't exactly in the mood to feed the animals. Uh, apparently the day before, she had gotten into an argument with her father, after he seemed to show low concern over the fact that her mother would likely not make it back to Japan in time for New Year's. Now the fight by itself wasn't exactly what was upsetting her so much. No, she was more concerned over the possibility that her father's apathy towards her mother's absence was... a sign that they didn't love each other anymore. Uh... Uh... Quick, play the music! I mean, jeez. Talk about your subject material you wouldn't normally see in your Sunday morning anime. And as it turns out, she wasn't the only one down. The mate of one of the hippos had been transferred to a different zoo, and the big guy named Gendro was more than a little depressed over the whole ordeal. Can't really blame the guy. Also, Gendro. Get it? Gendro? Genichiro? Though, if we're talking about guys who look like hippos, I think this guy qualifies a little more. And now I feel incredibly dirty for making a Killing Bites reference in a pre-care review. To try and cheer the big guy up, they clean up his pen and even lay out some tasty treats for him. I assume they didn't bake anything for him because there was no oven nearby, but you know they would've. Ultimately though, he still ends up sulking in his little corner. Though, said corner turns out to be his mate's half of the pen, so he was essentially safeguarding it for her. On top of that, while he only ate half of the food they had laid out for him, that could be interpreted as him saving the rest for her as well. These revelations ended up bringing with Ichika as she realized her father had done similar things while her mother was away. Not too surprisingly, Ichika went home that night to find her mother back from overseas. As it turns out, Genichiro knew for a while that she was going to be back in time for New Year's but wanted to keep it a surprise. Between this and the hippos, Ichika was able to realize how much her father truly loved her mother and for once was finally able to acknowledge him as best pre-cure dad. The chapter ends with Genjiro being reunited with his mate and the Kiapati introducing their latest creation, Hippo Pear Pancakes. I already like these things a lot more than the bear pancakes. Don't, don't let Hikuba san know I said that. Next up, we get a Japanese New Year chapter, which of course means everyone is in cute kimonos, except for Akira, who of course was wearing more of a male kimono and hakama pants ensemble. Granted, she kind of needed the looser clothes to pound some mochi in the next page, but come on girl, you don't have to take the dressing up like a guy thing that far. Kimono like that aren't cheap. 
Anyway, they used that mochi to make some really tasty looking osechi themed sweet. Seriously, where's the recipe for that stuff? I want to try them. And after closing out for the day, the elder gave them some money. Oh, not their actual paychecks or anything like that. Because heaven forbid the preacher have to worry about taxes and all that. Which by the way, Uncle Sam, I'm still waiting on my refund. But yeah, it was actually Otoshidama. Small amounts of cash the older generation gives to the newer generation on New Year's. My cheapskate uncle usually just gives us $2 bills as though that's something special. Yeah, thanks for giving us one of the most awkward bills to use at the grocery store. With all the formalities out of the way, Shield just decides to pretty much explain everyone's New Year's resolutions by going over everyone's plans for the future. Everyone except for Ichika, who clearly had no clue what she wanted to do with her life. Well, you could try honing your cake drawing skills, as I've heard there's a very lucrative and... disturbing market for that, with the otaku who celebrate their favorite character's birthdays. Including yours. Which speaking of which... Akira changes the subject to talk about Ichika's birthday, which was coming up. Wait, Ichika's birthday? Oh no, the climax is coming up. Quick, everyone bail before Grave Horizon is not to get up! Oh, no wait, I forgot. The Mangaverse is in an alternate continuity, so we're actually going to explore this conflict at least a little. January 6th arrived, and Ichika's parents threw her an early party before her actual birthday, which she would spend with her friends the next day. However, bringing up her friends only ended up reminding her that they would soon start marching towards their future, all the while Ichika still hadn't figured out what her dreams for the future were. To which her mom pointed out, with the most interesting of worrying, that she pretty much had already been living her dream every day by working at the Kirapati. That's actually a really nice quotable line. Though seriously, Mrs. Osami, why do you have to describe my morning every day? The next day, Ichika met up with her friends. Though unfortunately, they had to cancel their original plans to head to an amusement park due to the snow frosting the roads over. So instead, they just decided to play in the snow, and once Ichika arrived, they all crawled into a... rabbit-shaped Quincy white. When did they build something like that? I mean, yeah, they said that Ichika was running late, but even assuming she was running an hour late, it takes a lot longer than that to build a whole hut, much less something that intricate. Well, whatever. Ichika reveals the reason why she was late to the party. As it turns out, while it was her birthday, she also made a gift for her friends. A cake resembling the one from episode 8 of the anime, with the addition of a miniaturized Pegasus parfait, and, uh... Pecorine ice cream, I think. I say ice cream because according to Ichika, this was meant to be an all-mode cake, and I'll be damned if there's any less than three scoops of ice cream. And to further bring it home, she even takes a minute to explain the origins of the term, basically saying it's a gathering of many wonderful things. Even though the original term actually means in fashion, though I guess you could kind of stretch to me much like what they did with the original pie all mold. As really, to be in fashion, you do need a lot of diverse elements to come together to create a cohesive whole. Again, I must ask, why was there never an all mold dessert served in the anime titled Precure All Mold? Alright, oh, because they seldom came off as a real team. Thus, the chapter ends with a fun little snowball fight, and Ichika likely suffering a massive concussion after trying to jump with a giant snowball above her head. Goodbye, Master. Now, that previous chapter was actually the final chapter published in the pages of the monthly magazine Nakayoshi. So this next chapter was actually written specifically for this book, and I'm guessing by its content, it was written by the Kamikita Futago right after they saw the final episode of the anime. You'll see what I mean. The chapter opens with Ichika having returned home after apparently spending time abroad. And as we can see on the next page, she's gained a few inches. Yeah, this is the Kamikita's take on the epilogue to the series, and them showing the guys a toy how it should have been done. Seriously, what's the point of opening up shop in a third world country? Anyway, Ichika had returned to Japan for a reunion with her friends, and oh jeez, I love these designs. Again, I gotta give points to Kamikita's for having excellent fashion sense. These characters actually look like adults, rather than just slightly upscale versions of themselves like in the anime. Also, going by Himari's line here, plus the fact they came together in the same car, are Yukari and Akira living together now? I'm not trying to make Yuri jokes here, I'm just stating how it's presented. Anyway, they head up to the woods to dig up a time capsule they had buried a few years earlier. In it was a list of activities they would do for their little reunion. 
Let's see, go to the movies, hiking, go-karting, petition to have Digimon Tri removed from canon. Wait, they're doing a sequel? I'm out. First on the list was a little drive with the four younger girls piling into Shiel's me Cooper, while Yukari and Akia drove in their sports car. Though, due to the competitive nature of the drivers, it quickly turned into a little race, within the speed limit, mind you. Also, subtle to you two, subtle T. The rest of the day, they do some more mundane stuff, scuba diving, clothes shopping, checking out Himari's Dr. Seuss inventions. Yeah, Himari, your invention's nice and everything, but I think I'll pass. I'll never be able to see Bubbles the same way ever again after Infinity War. All of it ending with me concert and dinner party. Goes without saying they all had a great time. That said, with the day winding down, they can't help but feel like after getting to know their friends as they are now, they kind of feel a little distant. It's a feeling that we all get when we meet an old friend after being apart for a while. People change and progress in ways we can never imagine. Thus, we're unsure if our old friends share the same feelings as we do from back then. Wanting to create at least one last great memory between them, Shiel suggests they tackle the last thing on the list, create a legendary suite. Of course, this was something Ichika originally came up with, but she had no idea what they could make. Luckily, the Elder just comes in with a dessert recipe written on a stone tablet as though it were one of the Ten Commandments or something. Then again, considering that the god of the toy multiverse looks and sounds like a toddler, I guess it shouldn't be that much of a surprise. After baking a few sponge cakes of varying sizes and a whole lot of whipped cream, it becomes quickly apparent what they were making. And no, it's not the cake from the Rebellion story, though the heavily implied Yuri is still there. Thus, they double down and get right to work on what is, indeed, the most difficult type of confection to construct, and with a little elbow grease plus their signature catchphrases, they create, honestly, the most impressive suite in this entire series. And to think, they didn't even have to turn the entire planet into a cake. Seriously, what were the guys a toy on? And since they made a whole damn wedding cake, they figured they should do one of the most fundamental things you do with such a confection, aside from the wedding itself. Which, of course, is the first bite, and oh, come on! We get it already, Kamikitas. You really want to ship these two? You don't have to give them their own special panel to show that. Again, subtle tea. So anyway, apparently with this particular cake, you're not supposed to share your first slice with someone. Otherwise, you end up turning into an animal. Huh, well, that's an unusually complicated way of producing a Yakitate Japan reaction. <laughs> And thus, the manga just ends with all of our main characters turning into animals. Yeah, we had a nice chapter going with everyone reflecting on their journeys into adulthood, and we end on a... furry joke. Alright, that aside, these manga volumes took the original recipes from the anime and made them a lot more palatable. As I said at the top of this review, based on my research, I think this anime suffered from a severe lack of focus due to having too many writers. Probably one of the most unfortunate casualties of this was a near total lack of significant character development across the board. Meanwhile, over these two volumes, while the twins can't completely take all writing credit for these characters, they still more than deserve recognition for fleshing them out in ways they weren't in the anime. They were able to craft more believable conflicts for them, give them scenarios that better utilize their established abilities, forge far stronger and meaningful bonds with one another, and most importantly, were able to tie all of these stories together with strong themes of growing up and finding your place in the world. WTF in the aside, the epilogue in this manga held a lot more emotional weight, as while we didn't get to see what their exact occupations were like in the anime, we were able to infer that these were indeed adults who were trying to have at least one last great outing before parting ways again. Had this manga been given a few more volumes, or at least better source material, it could have been really great. As is, it's still quite enjoyable if you in any way enjoyed at least parts of the original anime. Not a must read, but if you feel like you need any sort of palate cleanser after watching Kira Kira's finale, this might do the job. If anything else, these books have sold me on the Kamikita Futago, and I look forward to their work on Hagato. 
we'll return to the works of the Kamikita Futago in good time. Next time, though, will be a review for Sweet Precure's film outing, and maybe a few things in between. And until next time, farewell for now, my friends, and... Oh, my bus is here.